Thank you guys so much for coming out today. I really appreciate it. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So today I'm going to be talking to you guys about education in Pakistan. I know the title um, right now doesn't mean a lot to you guys, but we will get there, I promise. Um, so I'd like to start with like a quick introduction. Uh, so can anyone kind of compare and contrast these two images? Just toss out things you see that are different between the two, uh, things that are similar. The education setting, one is in a classroom. I'm not sure if the other one is education. Okay. Sitting outside. I think both are, but it's just different attitude yeah. from the student. Okay. One is very super active, involved. The other is very passive. Yeah. Sit there, listening, you know, a bit afraid, you know. Yeah. Don't see any deaths or supplies mm -hmm. or anything like that. Well, these are the images that come up when you search up education in Canada, and then the image that would come up if you search up education in Pakistan. Now, as said, images speak uh, louder than words. Oh, a picture. <laughs> you guys know what I'm saying? Um, the images really show a lot about kind of the situation of, of education in Pakistan. As Mr. Wu said, there's almost fear in the left-hand side, uh, lack of supplies, lack of desks. And, and to be quite frank, they're not even a building. So it's just something for you guys to keep in mind as we move forward. And this is you know, the stark contrast, but the stark reality as well of education in Pakistan. Um, so I'm going to start with quick personal and uh, professional aspirations. So my professional aspiration is to become a doctor. I've always wanted to be a doctor. I intend to go to McGill next year to, um, <laughs> to, become, uh, to go into biomedical life sciences and then hopefully go to med school following. Uh, but my personal, my personal aspirations has always been related to education. I, I feel like I've had a really uh, privileged upbringing. I was born in Pakistan myself uh, and I moved from Pakistan to Calgary when I was about one year old. And I've had a phenomenal uh, privilege in having access to education very easily. Um, I've been able to go to great institutions. I'm here now. So I've been very, pro I've had a very privileged upbringing, but I have also been to Pakistan many times. I do know firsthand really what the, what the degree of inaccessibility of education is and how difficult it is for individuals living there. And that's kind of what um, sparked my interest in doing this plan. Uh, it's my home country. I really want to give back to it. And I feel like I've been very privileged. And that entitles me to give back and do, do what I can to make a change. So just a little background context and research about Pakistan. Um, unemployment is about 6.6%, but this is very likely an understatement. Um, this doesn't account for rural areas. A lot of the data collection techniques aren't very effective in Pakistan. Uh, some people are, don't have access and can't give their uh, feedback and input. Same goes for poverty, 12.4% officially. Once again, much, much higher than this uh, if you were to look at a realistic estimate. But 124 itself is about 22 uh, million people, which is a substantial amount of people living below the poverty line. 45.1% of the population over 15 are illiterate. That is almost half the population that is above 15 cannot read or write. Uh, and then 2.1% of the GDP, so the gross domestic product, is kind of an economic indicator which shows you know, what, how much money a country is making and what that money is going towards. So only 2.1% of that is going to um, education. The total GDP is about $236.6 billion, so 2% of that. Very small value. Um, something to keep in mind, though, is 236.6 billion is Pakistan's GDP for a country of about 182 million people. Canada, to put into context, is a country of 33 million people, roughly, and their GDP is two billion. Uh, sorry, is two trillion. So stark, stark contrast. There's much more money available to fewer people when compared to Pakistan. A lot more people, a lot less money available. And a small fraction of that is going to education. The literacy rate has increased at less than 1% a year. So is there improvement? Yes, but less than 1% a year. 
it's been very slow um, and definitely it's not growing at the same speed as for example the population so it's definitely something to keep in mind the literacy rate of age 10 years and above is 31 percent 47 percent male and only 14 percent female and this is even worse in rural areas where the literacy for females is between three and eight percent so education is a very very legitimate issue in Pakistan and it's not a matter of the quality of education it's more the matter of the accessibility of education people are living in poverty they don't have a lot of children will have to work for their families to provide for their families and having access to education is very difficult before moving on to my actual plan however there are a couple things I need to consider um, and this is just a quick blurb about my risk assessment Pakistan is uh, it does have th terrorist threats. Um, Pakistan, especially the northern rural areas, are very um, are at high risk of Taliban. A little bit better in the south, in Karachi, which is the main city, which is where I'm from and where I intend to be focusing my plan in on. But it's definitely something I need to consider. There's a lot of political unrest. Um, after following the assassination of uh, Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto, there was a lot of unrest, a lot of I don't want to say anarchy, but there are a lot of uncertainty of where the government kind of stands, and they haven't, especially the prevent, the federal government hasn't, has had a lot of difficulties in providing for the people. Municipal governments are somewhat better. Uh, Karachi, uh, a very large city, once again, where I'm planning my uh, gap, is much better c comparison, but it's not the case for the entire country. And also, health-wise, I have to consider there's high risk of uh, hepatitis, typhoid, other waterborne diseases, so it's definitely something I need to keep in mind of if I am to work there. And also, coming in as a foreigner, although I was born there, I have to keep in mind that I'm not technically from there anymore. Uh, I would be seen as a foreigner, and I have to respect the fact that although I was born in that culture, I haven't been grown up in it, and I need to be aware and uh, respectful of the fact that people might might not be as happy if I were to just come in you know with this great plan and just start applying it there has to be some sort of plan that I can move forward and you know an outlook I can use to get there which brings me to my statement of intent so my plan is to address education in Pakistan as I'm sure you guys have picked up on by now um, and I tend to do this on kind of multiple levels one is the most basic collecting tuition fees for uh, individuals in Pakistan so people so people can actually afford to go to school um, apart from that also a lot of uh, institutions educational institutions in Pakistan especially in rural areas are lacking in teachers they're under resourced so I also want to I want to address the fact that there's more teachers available for you know students that want to learn and also I just want to kind of promote that idea of education. I want to uh, spread it more so, not even in Pakistan itself, but even in the community that I live in, whether that be at McGill or here, just so that people are more aware of education in third world countries and why it's so important. So I want to do this by partnering up with a institution that already works in Pakistan, which is key because they are familiar, they know the culture, they've been working there for many years now. So Teach for Pakistan is the uh, organization that I would like to work with. They have a model very similar to mine. They are collecting tuition fees so that they can funnel those to uh, children that want to go to school but can't afford it. But they also have a really great program um, that basically takes postgraduates and they'll come in and they'll almost do a fellowship program for about two years where they actually work at an under-resourced school and they will teach and it's a great experience for um, them and once again it's kind of an opportunity for them to become more aware of what they want to do but also give back to the community they're teaching uh, kids that really want to learn um, that are trying their best to be there so it's a great program and it's one I've definitely found a lot of similarities with between my own model and theirs. So that brings me to my five-year plan. So next year I'll be going to McGill, um, and McGill has a Pakistani Students Association. So why reinvent the wheel? There's an uh, institution there that already is aware of Pakistan, uh, the uh, Pakistan situation. They are um, 
they, they've been established in McGill for a while, and these are all people that obviously are interested in Pakistan and want to make a difference, make a change. So I, was, I intend to partner up with them um, and begin a campaign, the title of the presentation, called Enlightening Education Expedition, which I think really sums it up nicely. It's alliteration, which is always fun. But uh, it's enlightening individuals about education and the journey that you take towards it, because it's not just a one-step donation, then you're done. It's, right, like education continues throughout your life, and making sure that we're making a long-lasting change is very important to me. So that's why I go back to the idea of changing perception of education, making people more aware of what needs, why, why education uh, in Pakistan or any country for that matter really needs to be a focus. Um, so I'd like to begin uh, in years one and two, begin raising funds and promoting my mission statement. So I have this campaign idea. I really want to do. I, I intend on doing like use book drives, bake sales, just things that promote um, promote awareness of my of my topic of education in Pakistan, but also an easy way to collect tuition fees. Now. My benchmark for that would be 16200 in fundraising over the first two years. That value comes from the Teach for Pakistan website. They, have, they say that it takes about 13,500 Pakistan, uh, Pakistani rupees to fund a child's tuition for one year. So that translated to Canadian dollars is about $160 per year for one student's tuition. So that number there will offer 100 students one year tuition, which is and is a awesome place to start, and I think would make a huge difference, and just expand and continue the campaign over the years. Um, and then years three and four, so continue campaign, continue fundraising. I want to bump up double the number that I had originally. Uh, sorry, 1.5 times as much I raised the first two years. So I have a larger tuition amount that I can provide to Teach for Pakistan. They can. Uh, funnel it to the appropriate students. They are established there. They know best. Um, but also, during the summer, I occasionally go to Pakistan. And I intend, during years three and four, to go to Pakistan, become more di directly involved in the education movement there. Um, going back to the fact that they do have good educational institutions. It's more a matter of having the access to it. So I want to work with Teach for Pakistan, hopefully. I've contacted them. Unfortunately, I haven't heard back yet. But I've made contact. and. I will continue to try and do so, and hopefully, especially in years one and two, establish that um, that footing with them, so that they're aware of my interests and I'm able to ask how I can help and what I can do. Also, expand campaign to Pakistan to further, you know, bring their idea, show what I've been doing at McGill, and why I think it's a great thing, why I believe it's been successful, or if it hasn't been su successful, would they, if they have any suggestions or anything they could do to help me. And then year five, year five, I intend to be finishing up. Oh, well, year four, I'll be finishing up my undergraduate. So hopefully in year five, I want to be going to med school. Um, one thing to keep in mind for med school, though, is if I do go, I need to realize that I'll be busy. <laughs> I'll be very, very busy. So as far as if I go into medicine, I need to be aware that joining uh, Teach for Pakistan more permanently would be very difficult. But what I can do is continue my campaign, my uh, idea at med school, carry it over, apply it wherever I do go. If I don't go to med school, which it's a very difficult thing to get into, so if I don't, I do need to be aware of that. I can, you know, and I do personally believe that I would be very interested in going to education. It's a personal aspiration, and I would love to teaching, love to go into teaching. So. If that is the case, then I would definitely consider um, going to Pakistan and seeing how I can get more tangibly involved with Teach for Pakistan. They have a fantastic two-year program, which I would, I'm definitely considering going into if that's how things turn out. And also, if I do become a doctor, however, there's also Doctors Without Borders, which I think is an important thing to consider. Pakistan does have a lot of, is at high risk of a lot of infectious diseases, so I could. I could kind of you know, take care of the body and the mind at the same time, uh, join Doctors Without Borders, become more involved in Pakistan as a country, and then at the same time, uh, I can you know, get more involved with education, 
I'll be on the ground in Pakistan acting as a doctor, but I will also have the ability, of course, this after med school and moving on from med school, uh, give back to the community education-wise and get involved in there. And yeah, that is my five-year plan. These are my references. Thank you guys very much. Open the floor to some questions. Sure. I have a great idea, obviously, and the uh, country like Pakistan definitely I mean, they need to upgrade their education yep. system. So, in your plan, you obviously want to go back to work. Do you still have some family connections back in? I do. I actually, and it's actually very uh, great that you mentioned that. I do have a lot of close family there. A lot of my cousins live there, my, grand, my grandparents live there, uncles, aunts, and I think that'll also be great for me when I'm going back. They'll be able to kind of, they're all they're the same age as me. They're very involved in their schools. So it's a great kind of word of mouth, get more, get a better sense of you know, how they're doing in their schools and where they see some issues and where they see uh, more work can be done. So I do have family there. Uh, and I will. Being visiting them recently? The last three years I have not, but I am going this summer. And you still have a very close contact? Very, yeah, very close contact, very close family. Um, so yeah. It's very important when you go oh, absolutely. to a place, you know, as you said, you have been raised in Canada, so you're basically a Canadian. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Pakistan, so knowing the culture, you know, uh, uh, is very critical yeah. you know, in your plan. So if you still have the close contact back home, they will guide you yeah. in case there is a uh, sort of a, a, a gap. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, right. yeah. And I, you know, I'm you i familiar with the language. I can speak it almost fluently, but at the same time... Oh, yeah, but at the same time, people can tell um, that I haven't been raised there. Mm. You know, I'm not, I'm not on I'm spot. writing? I can't write, which is also an issue. I can't write. I can only speak it. Um, I can understand very well, but... I'm limited to only speaking, so that's also a great point why family would be really helpful, people who can support me. So, yeah. Thanks, Mr. Wu. I have a couple questions. Absolutely. Well done. That was Thank great. you. Um, first, you talked about only 2.1% 2, 2 of the GDP going to education. Why do you feel that Pakistan undervalues education so much, especially when it comes to distribution of funds like that? Yeah. Did you do much research? I did, and I, I was actually very interested in seeing where you know, where the rest of that money goes to. And I was interested to find that a lot of it goes, it, it's, the data was very disgruntled. Um, interesting enough, I thought military spending would be very high. Yeah. Military spending was at 2%. Wow. So that was, yeah, exactly. See, now, that was the data that was available on the CIA government website. Um, it's, it should be very accurate, so I'm not certain, and it, I could not find other data that kind of corresponded, like what percentage of GDP went to what. The only values I could find were for military and for healthcare, I think, was also around three, four-ish percent. So all very small values. So I, I am actually quite uncertain to what the rest of that money. They spend their money. Yeah, yeah, or at least what they're telling us. Okay. Yeah. And um, also, you talk a lot about Teach for Pakistan. Yep. Is your plan to maybe um, emerge, like merge your campaign and theirs together, or do you see your campaign in the future becoming a, like a separate entity mm -hmm. that is yours that you're going to build upon? Um, do you always work with them? It's a very good question. Um, so I consider this a lot, whether you know starting my own organization, and you know it's. It'd be great. Uh, I do have a really good idea of what I want to do and all that. But at the same time, it goes back to the fact that I'm still very foreign to cultures and stuff like that in Pakistan. So for me, at least at this point, I believe it'd be much easier to not, not even merge, but work alongside, um, kind of f do my stuff in Canada, like use my campaign, my idea in Canada, and then use that to support Teach for Pakistan. Um, you know, promote what Teach for Pakistan does, but use my um, my campaign more as a just promotional thing. What I also need to keep in mind is if I do go into med school or something like that, for me to allocate time, effort, money to establishing a proper organization in Pakistan would be very difficult. So I intend on working alongside 
uh, teach for Pakistan because they've already established there. They're an organization that knows what they're doing. They've had success, great success over the last 10 years, and they're growing uh, substantially. So I think working alongside them and working with them would be more beneficial for reaching the goal. Well, and there's always that possibility that you might inspire people at McGill when you mm -hmm. begin your exactly that will be more involved, and maybe they can take it a little further with you, right? Yeah. When you're in med school and you're focused on that. I'm, yeah, Maybe exactly. You have people alongside that can help you push your goals forward. Exactly, yeah. Thanks. So, I'm oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. No, no. I was going to say, one thing that we have talked about, too, is sort of the way he leads on the way it depends, but if he ends up going to medical school, I know literacy is a big issue, but obviously STEM fields would also be an mm -hmm. interesting area as well, so science and technology, in terms of whether or not that might be skill sets that if Teach for Pakistan had interest in, um, outside of general literacy, that that might be something that he could help with, and just in terms of, you know, the basic education. Mm -hmm. So, absolutely. Like Maybe just uh, extending or adding to uh, what this two panels has said, being a happy effect at Appleby for a year, yeah, and not only a year, but you also, you know, came to Appleby to attend, yeah, so knowing uh, a lot of people in this community, yeah, and uh, you may want to use the resource mm -hmm. that you have accumulated in the past. One thing I want to say this to you is, I'm a Canadian right now, yeah. but I grew up in China. Yeah. Um, country of China and Pakistan, I don't know if you're aware of that. Mm -hmm. These two countries are very, very loyal to each other. Yeah. In fact, Pakistan people treat Chinese people very, very well yeah. every time you go to Pakistan and vice versa, and Chinese people and respect the Pakistan because whenever there is a major crisis, mm -hmm. whether in either country or in the world, and these two countries always stand up together. Yeah. So what I'm thinking is we have quite a significant amount, a number of Chinese students in a school, yeah. or maybe go to McGill, you will see a lot of Absolutely. guidance for Chinese students. You may use those resources to help you to, you know, as uh, uh, Mr. Dante was saying that mm -hmm. we can mobilize more people. Yeah, for sure. I, that's actually a really good point. Yeah. Same cost. Right? Yeah. Um, I have a question. Another question for you, though, is um, you set a target for $16,200 yeah. for first year. Now, that target, I guess, partly because you're thinking uh, that, can, uh, uh, that money is enough to sponsor 100 students. Yeah. But do you think that number is, uh, in terms of collecting them, raising them yep. in, a, in a McGill next year, uh, two years, do you think it would be uh, um, achievable or maybe it's just bars too low? Um, I'm asking. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, I think it's better to set the bar lower. Um, definitely aim, you know, shoot for the stars, but also set realistic benchmarks. I haven't currently, I haven't been to McGill. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I like I visited, but I haven't started school at McGill. I don't know uh, just how to, you know, really establish myself there. I do have plans on what I'm going to do, like use book drives, bake sales. But I also have to keep in mind that it might not be as easy to get very large sums of mo money very quickly. And I have had a lot of experience personally in fundraising. Uh, I've done it back home in Saudi Arabia. I've done it. Uh, here to some extent, it's <laughs> aiming for a very large sum of money is great, but it's also keeping in mind that it's hard. M money is hard to collect, especially when it's in the thousands. So you just need to keep in mind that you are collect. So I am planning to collect this over the first two years, but I also have to establish myself first. I have to, you know, show the idea to the PSA in McGill. So just things I need to do before I can start moving forward with actual fundraising. Um, I've, I've chosen a pretty reasonable amount, I think, 100 students. And I can also use that as part, like I'm planning to use that all, as part of my promotion. Like you can send 100 students to Pakistan, uh, in Pakistan to go into school. Like it's a tangible number. Um, people can visual, visualize it better and are more aware of what, kind of where their money is going. So I, that's why I chose uh, 16,000. 16, mm -hmm. um, of course, after the first two years, I'll be able to better gauge how, gauge how much money is realistically I can expect to make in a year um, and fundraise in a year to go towards this. So I think I've just chosen a public-friendly number that also I can... Uh, 
it's a much more tangible value that I can work towards fundraising. Then after the first two years, I can kind of see what well, to do with my it. My advice to you would be uh, that don't be discouraged if yep. you cannot raise the money to that the target at the same mm-hmm. time. Don't give up. Yeah. Right. Keep working hard on that. Right? Right. Um Now, when you mentioned you, you're saying that the, the the student go to school, they have to pay tuition. Yeah. In the package, that's yep. the system. So there's uh, like a, all like a, it's not government. It's not government funded. No. So every student has to pay a fee yep. to go to uh, school, no matter whether elementary or high yep. school. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I just wanted to ask you when we were talking about the fundraising um, at McGill. I mean, at McGill, you'll have uh, a club on every corner selling cupcakes and yeah. like samosas and everything under the sun. So maybe um, just as something to think about, or maybe you already have. Also, look at how you can um, create greater awareness yeah. for your cause um, with from like the people in which you're wanting to solicit donations from. Mm-hmm. In some ways, and, and maybe and if you look at how we do things here on campus, sometimes it's having um, fundraisers that um, relate more specifically to the cause. So whether you're selling Pakistani food yeah. or you know mm-hmm. any other number of things, maybe that can sure. become part of that um, process through working with the Pakistani Students Association. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's, a, that's a really good point. Thank you, Ms. Keogh. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, guys.